current events, Bible prophecy, the ancient past. How does it all fit together? Find out now. This is Pictures of the End. Hello and thank you for joining us today. You are listening to Pictures of the End. My name is Tim Rumsey, and I look forward to spending the next 30 minutes or so with you as we explore the Old Testament book of Judges. The title of today's episode is Judges, Gideon's Army, and Revelation's Three Angels. Before we dive into that study, I would like to invite you to check out our website at pathwaytoparadise.org. You can follow the links there for pictures of the end and find recordings of this episode, as well as every previous episode that we have produced. We also have a number of other Bible study resources available on our website, DVDs, videos, books, study guides, and so forth. And we hope that those will be of benefit and blessing to you in your continued study of God's Word. Again, the title of today's episode is Judges, Gideon's Army, and Revelation's Three Angels. Now, the book of Judges covers the history of the Hebrew nation from the death of Joshua to the time of Samuel, a period that covers about 400 years. It traces the transition of the Israelites from a nomadic to an agricultural people and also records the many battles and wars that they waged against the Canaanites and others who lived in the land of promise. Now, God had promised the Israelites that he would bring them into the promised land, that he would give them complete possession of that land as well, if they would follow him, serve him, obey him, and worship only him. The book of Judges records the sad history of the failure of the Israelites to completely serve and worship God only. And as we look at the experience that the Hebrew nation had, we see periods of victory where they follow God, where they uh, confess their sins at times, where he gives them the promised victory over their enemies. And then we find other times as well of spiritual lows, where the people slip into idolatry, the worship of other nations around them, where they compromise their beliefs and their standards. And as they do this, God allows them to be overrun by their enemies. And this is the cycle that repeats itself through the book of Judges. Well, let's start reading a couple verses in Judges chapter 2, beginning in verse 7, where we read what happens now in the beginning of this uh, period of Israel's history. The Bible says that the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being a hundred and ten years old. And the Bible says that they buried him in the borders of his inheritance um, on the north side of the hill Gash. And so Joshua dies. He was the one, of course, that led Israel after Moses had died. It was through Joshua that God brought the Israelites across the Jordan River. Uh, It was through Joshua that the city of Jericho was taken. Much of the other victories that Israel gained were uh, gained during the lifetime of Joshua. But now Joshua has died, and the Bible explains next what happens after his death. Uh, The Bible says, going on in verse 10 of Judges 2, that also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And then the Bible records this sad history. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served Baal. That was one of the the gods of the Canaanite nations. And Judges 2 verse 12 says this, They forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. Now God had warned the Israelites specifically against worshiping the gods are participating in the religious rites and ceremonies of the people that lived in Canaan. He had warned them about what would happen, that uh, as they did this, that they would forsake the protection of God and that he would allow them to be overrun by their enemies. And rather than um, going from victory to victory, they would experience defeat and um, would not experience that promise that God had given them to bring them completely into this land of Canaan. 
In Judges chapter 2, we read that this is exactly what happens. Verse 14 goes on by saying, The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. And so this is how the book of Judges begins by explaining why the uh, Israelites were so often overrun and conquered by their enemies during this time period. It was because of their neglect to serve and worship God alone and because of their fascination with the religions and the gods of the people that they were supposed to be uh, driving from the land. Now, as Judges 2 continues, it explains what God does in response to this. We read in Judges 2, verse 16, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods, and bowed themselves unto them, and turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so." So God, in love and mercy, raises up um, these men, and actually there were, there were women as well uh, included in these judges. God raises up these judges that uh, would be used to call people back to the worship of God. Very often they were used as uh, warriors, as the leaders of armies, to go and, and repel the oppressors from the land of Canaan here, or the dwellings of the Israelites. And these judges served both as spiritual leaders, as, as political leaders, um, as, as magistrates, and as uh, you know, chieftains, kind of, to, to lead the people into battle. And again, this cycle continues for hundreds of years in this early history of the nation of Israel. We read in verse 18 of Judges 2 that when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings, by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Now, as we look at this history of Israel, we need to remember that Judges is designed as more than a simple historical narrative. It also presents a sacred philosophy of history. It demonstrates that righteousness exalts a nation, but that sin is the reproach of any people, that sin brings divine punishment, and that deliverance never comes from unaided human efforts, but from the strength and enthusiasm inspired by the Spirit of God. We could summarize the entire book by stating that its goal is to demonstrate through the history of the Hebrews that the source of happiness and safety for a nation and for individuals is in serving God. Now, it's interesting that several times in the book of Judges, the the book tells us that there was no king in Israel. Often it's phrased this way, at that time, every man did that which was right in his own eyes, for there was no king in Israel. And as we read some of the stories about what is happening among the people of God uh, here at this time, they're they're hair-raising stories, and they're some of the most graphic stories in the Old Testament. For instance, there is much intertribal warfare among the Israelites with one tribe attacking, um, at times almost nearly destroying another tribe. There are stories of, of sodomy, of murder. Uh, one particularly graphic example, there was a man with his concubine. She, she is raped by some other Israelites from another tribe. When he finds out she's dead, he, he takes her home and then cuts her up into 12 parts sends those body parts to the other tribes of Israel and calls them to war against the, the Benjamites, the, the tribe that had allowed this to happen. And uh, sure enough, the, the other tribes come. They eventually nearly wipe out the tribe of Benjamin. Then they realize, uh, look, one of our tribes is going to be lost forever if we don't do something. So they end up basically abducting women from other tribes and giving them to the few Benjamite men that remain. These are the kinds of stories that make up much of the book of Judges. And we see that in many ways there is chaos in the land. And again, as the book of Judges puts it, there is chaos because there is no king in Israel. 
Well, it's interesting to compare this period of of Israelite, of Hebrew history, with what the Bible tells us the condition of Christianity will be at the very end of time. I'm reading now from 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, and Paul writes this, Know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now this is bad enough, but then in the next verse, Paul reveals that these things will be happening inside the church. In other words, among those that claim to be Christians. He says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. And when we take an honest look at Christianity as a whole in the world today, we have to admit that in many ways it seems like this prophecy of Paul is being fulfilled right now within Christianity. For example, the largest Christian church in the world continues to be rocked by sexual abuse scandals, Nearly all Christian denominations in Western countries continue to lose members. In the Western world especially, Christianity seems to be losing its influence as society and public morals continue to swing further away from a biblical foundation. Nearly 30% of Christian pastors across the board from all denominations admit to watching pornography at least one time a month. 63% of those pastors say they struggle with sexual addictions. And the divorce rate within the church basically equals the divorce rate that is outside the church. What is happening within Christianity? Why is there the chaos that so closely resembles the chaos we see in the book of Judges? Well, the problem, according to the author of the book of Judges, is that there was no king in Israel. Is it possible that there is no king within Christianity? Is this what Paul is saying will happen? Well, what do you mean, no king within Christianity? There is only one person uh, that has ever claimed or should be the king of Christianity, and that is Jesus Christ. And, you know, many people are content to claim Jesus as their Savior, but it's a little different, maybe a little more challenging to claim Jesus as their Lord and King. You know, Jesus himself said in Matthew 16, verse 24, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Yes, it's important to claim Jesus as as my Savior, as the one who saves and forgives me from my sins. That's absolutely important. It's beautiful to do that. But if it only stops there, if my commitment to Christ doesn't go to the place where I'm willing to allow him to be my Lord and King, to the place where I allow him to take control of my life and to show me how to live according to his will and his word, then I will be lacking the uh, experience with Jesus that gives me the power to live the, the, the way that he wants to. And this is exactly what Bible prophecy here in 2 Timothy is pointing toward. It is revealing a time will come within Christianity where it is it does not have the power of God within it because Christians, while they may be willing to claim Christ as Savior, are not really allowing Jesus into their lives as Lord and King. There is a solution for this. We'll look at that when we come back from the break. Is your life so busy you don't seem to have time to read the Bible? Do you want to understand the Bible better but don't know where to start? Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, a daily Bible study podcast designed to help you connect with God's Word. Each 15-minute podcast looks at a timely and relevant subject, connecting the Bible's timeless teachings with your life today. Want to dive in even deeper? Our website includes free weekly study guides that accompany each lesson. Go ahead, dive into God's Word, dig a little deeper, discover the Bible's message for you today. Deeper can be found on your favorite podcast service, including iTunes and Google Play. You can also subscribe online at www.pathwaytoparadise.org. That's www.pathwaytoparadise.org. Or call us toll-free at 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.
Welcome back. You are listening to Pictures of the End, and we are continuing our study of the book of Judges and finding its lessons for us today. Now, during this time period in Israel's history, God allowed many enemies to, at least for a time, overrun the the land that the Israelites had gained and to actually control the Israelites, either to exact taxes from them or to oppress them in other ways. And we see in the book of Revelation that there is a great enemy that wants to overrun God's people at the very end of time. We read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, that the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so we find a similar situation that there is an enemy that wants to attack you if you claim to be a Christian, if you claim to follow God and to follow Jesus Christ today. There is an enemy that wants to come in and take control of your life, that wants to um, separate you from the purpose and the plan that God has for you. Now, praise God, the book of Revelation reveals that in spite of this hostile environment, in spite of the attacks by Satan, Uh, to pull people away from God, there will be people that stand faithfully and serve and worship God at the very end of time. We read in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Now we're gonna look at the experience of this group of people. What gives them this kind of power at a time in Earth's history where Christianity has largely lost its power as we discovered in the first half of our program? What is the key that gives them uh, this, this faith and this willingness to follow and obey Jesus to order their lives after the, the guidelines in his word, no matter what happens? We're going to look at a story in the book of Judges that will parallel the experience of these people here at the end of time. And by studying the story in Judges, we can better understand what God wants to do uh, in each of our lives today. Now, this story that we're looking at is the story of Gideon. He was one of the judges that God raised up to uh, bring the people back to God. He was to work both a spiritual reformation. He was also to lead uh, an army of Israelites against the Midianites. That was the group of people that was oppressing Israel in this particular case. And as we start with the story in Judges chapter 6, we find that the Midianites have invaded and controlled Israel for several years now. And Gideon is actually forced to thresh wheat secretly in a wine press out of sight so that uh, his grain will not be stolen or destroyed by the enemy. As he is doing this, suddenly he turns around and sees a stranger standing there. This stranger turns out to be an angel from heaven who is giving Gideon his commission from God to uh, for, you know, call together an army and to free Israel from the Midianites. Well, Gideon eventually does this and he calls 32,000 men of Israel that form his army. Now that may sound like a lot, but the Midianites had an army of about 135,000 men, the Bible tells us. And so Gideon starts with a, uh, an army that is greatly outnumbered by the enemy. And yet, God does something very surprising as Gideon is preparing to advance and start marching with his army. In Judges chapter 7, God says to Gideon, I'm reading in Judges 7 verse 2, the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, mine own hand has saved me. In other words, God says to Gideon, yes, you only have 32,000 men against their 135,000, but it's too many men. Uh, The Israelites would take the credit for themselves. They would take the glory for themselves if they win, and I would not receive the glory that I should. And so God says, tell the people or tell your army, anybody that is afraid can go home. They don't have to stay and fight. They go home. Well, Gideon does this, and 22,000 soldiers end up leaving his army, leaving him with only 10,000 people. Now he's even more outnumbered than he was before, 10,000 compared to 135,000 in the Midianite army. And God says to Gideon again, you are still, you still have too many in your army. It's, it's too much. And so God devises a test. He says, take your army down to this, this river or this stream and tell them in to drink. Anybody who laps the water like a dog, um, you know, just quickly scooping it into their mouth, uh, or 
lapping the water with their with their tongue uh, can stay in your army. But any soldier that kneels down and cups their hands and drinks more leisurely, they need to go home as well. Uh, and, and we understand that God was testing the commitment and the courage of the soldiers, those that were focused on their mission to serve God, to live their lives uh, in obedience to his call to fight in this case, they were to stay in the army. Those who were more relaxed uh, about uh, advancing and continuing to march forward, they would be dismissed and allowed to go home. Well, Gideon does this, and at the end of the day, there are only 300 men left in Gideon's army. And finally, God says, now you have the right number. I can use 300 men to fight this vast army of Midianites. Now, God tells or instructs Gideon to do something um, very unusual. He divides his army of 300 men into three groups. So there are now three groups of 100 men each. And Gideon gives to every soldier a trumpet and a, a light, a pitcher, that, or a light that's covered by a pitcher. And he says now in Judges chapter 7, Verse 17, look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall you do. So they're going to watch Gideon and and do what he does as they attack the enemy. He goes on and says, when I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Well, they do just that. In the night, they separate into three groups. They sneak up on the enemy camp, and on the Gideon's signal, they, they remove or break the pitchers covering their lamps, and they blow on their trumpets, and they shout the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. And what happens next is absolutely amazing. The Bible says in Judges chapter 7, verse 21, they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled uh, away from the tribe or from the uh, Israelite army. Actually, most of the Midianites end up dying because they fight each other. Um, there's great confusion that is called. They think there's a vast army attacking them from, from all sides. They hear the shouting, they hear the trumpets, they see these lights. It's the middle of the night, they're confused and disoriented. And the Midianites end up basically destroying themselves. Those that remain, many of them are captured or slain. And the power of the Midianites is broken completely and forever. They never really posed a serious threat to Israel again after this experience. Well, what are we to learn from this story of Gideon and his army of 300 men divided into three groups? The lights that they carried with them... uh, are symbolic of the word of God. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And friends, it is as we take God's word, as we place our faith in it and in him, in in God, that he can work in our lives, that he can give us the strength, the, the power and the victories that we need in our lives. It comes through the word of God. The Bible even compares the Bible to a sword, a double-edged sword. And it's interesting, you know, Gideon's army didn't fight with swords. They had trumpets and they had lights, um, but they did not have swords. And yet the Bible tells us that the word of God is as a sword. And just as God gave a miraculous victory to Gideon and his army as they, they, they carry not a sword but a light representing the word of God, God promises to give victory to you, uh, to your family, uh, to every person who places their trust and their faith in Jesus and in the Word of God today. Now, let's go back to Revelation as we tie this together. Again, Revelation chapter 14 shows a group of people that are victorious in this fight against sin, against Satan against the enemies of God at the end of time. We read again in Revelation 12, verse 14, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Just as Gideon's army advanced and was victorious by carrying these lights, Jesus promises that today you can be victorious in your life. You can be victorious uh, in your battle against 
sin and temptation through the power of God, through the power found in his word, through the power in his promises. And here we see that it will happen. There will be people that are victorious through the power of Jesus Christ, and they're identified here in Revelation 14, verse 12. It's also interesting to note that Revelation even describes that at the very end of time, as Jesus Christ is about to come back, the enemies of God, which had temporarily been united together to fight against him, they will actually end up turning against one another and destroying themselves. We read in Revelation chapter 17 about ten horns. These represent the the political powers of earth that are united together. Revelation 17 verse 12 says, The ten horns which thou saw are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. But what happens a short time later, when they realize that they're fighting against God, and as God... um, gives victory to his people, here's what happens. Revelation 17, verse 16 says, The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Do not miss this point, friends, that it is the word of God that will be victorious in the end. And if you place your life on the Word of God, if you make decisions based on the principles in the Bible, on the instructions and the laws that God gives, God promises that you will be victorious, that there is no power that can separate you from Him. So as we look today at the state of our world, at the state of the church, at the state of Christianity, we see many parallels with the time period described in the book of Judges. And yet we find reason for hope as well. Because just as God gave victory to Gideon and to those 300 soldiers that uh, remained completely devoted to God and to fulfilling his purpose, we have the promise that God will give victory to each person who places their trust in him at the end of time. And the Bible actually describes in Revelation 14 three angels which carry the word of God to the world. And these represent those people that will remain faithful to God. Just as Gideon had an army of three groups to accomplish God's purpose, at the end of time, God has an army of angels and of people, three of them, that carry his message to the world. And he wants you to be part of that victorious army. And he promises that you can be through Jesus Christ. You have been listening to Pictures of the End, a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. Pictures of the End is available via your favorite podcast service and also at www.picturesoftheend.com.